Hey everybody, welcome. It's Craig Shoemaker with the Enlightened Up Podcast. And uh, make sure you subscribe. Well, you probably are already, but if you're not, uh, I'll tell some other people. And also give us a nice rating. Just pass the word around and uh, because we're about enlightening the world up. We certainly need that right now, don't you think? And uh, speaking of lightening up, uh, lighting up the room, and uh, <laughs> this guy's been lighting up the room for a very long time. One of my favorites, actually, and I, I've never said that before, so it can't be one of those intros of when I've said, let me see, yeah. Uh, no, I never said it before. So he is truly one of my favorites for many reasons, and we'll get into it. We've had uh, a few about 10 minutes together in my studios here, and it's actually, it was really, really hard. Like, not that we have a thing called SIFTA, save it for the air. Yeah. It was so difficult to have a conversation with you because I, I was, that would be good stuff to put on the air. That's the thing is with comedians, especially if you don't see one another in a while. Yeah. Anyway, Jamie Kennedy is our guest today. Thank from, you for having me, friend. Oh, man. It's, it, it, you've been so good to me. I mean, going back to Scream 2, you were the big star. I show up. I did some replacement shots because the guy apparently didn't do a good job. Hey, you're back. You were good to me. But, oh, uh, well... You were no well, you. Let's, let's start with you being go good ahead. to me. Okay, right. go ahead. So Jamie was so nice. He introduced me, Wes Craven. He's there. Do you know who this is? Because they had a lot of cameos, but they didn't think that I was a cameo. But you did. You're like, hey, this is Craig Shoemaker. Because I guess did you grow up like watching me or listening to me in Philadelphia or something? I grew up in Philly. Yeah, and uh, I used to have a clock radio, and <laughs> I want to <laughs> s- remember those. <laughs> Uh, red. No, the worst part is I remember it, but now I'm associated with a clock man. radio. <laughs> <laughs> hey, man. That was, that's a really... That, I don't that, mean to diss. That, that, yeah, that, that took me down. I mean, Dude, I, people I was, equate me with MySpace, so was, we're all around. I, I was up for a second, and then, and then you know, well, I had a clock radio <laughs> well, with an 8-track in it. You were, you know, so. uh, it had a... Uh, no, it had, it had a... Uh, uh, cassette eight tracks were before that, <laughs> but um, you know the keep on trucking thing. Uh, no, so y- and you were all. You, I was in high. I want to say maybe. I want to say when did you start comedy? High school, but seventies or eighties. Eighties, yeah. Early eighties. Yeah, early eighties. Like, yeah. would you would you be on the radio in eighty four? Absolutely. Okay, yeah. so I want to say yeah. eighth grade because I used to listen to. And I want to see it was MMR. I used to go back before right. between MMR and YSP, but let's just say MMR. John DeBella. John DeBella, and they had fr- uh, Friday Funnies. Yep. And they used to play Billy Idol, Rebel Yell, and I was in eighth grade, and you would go on, and you would do Love Master, and you would do 15 <laughs> different voices, and I would just be crying <laughs> laughing. Oh, I love it. And I was, and then, boom, you were, like, huge. Yeah. And you were you were huge on the scene, in which I didn't follow, but you were just huge in Philly. Yeah. And then you, Moved then on. when I came to L.A., when I first came out, you were like one like comedian of the year, like the first year I got in L.A., like late eighties, early nineties. Yeah, nineties. Yeah. And I was like, I that's that's five o'clock funnies right, right there. Right. That that's a local me. man. That, and then yeah, that helped a lot. And then I got scream, and then you know yeah. I was like, they was we did the scene, which is crazy, bro. Cause, I have, like, dementia I'm starting to get because I forgot that. And so I did a whole thing on my YouTube about the scene, and you saw the clip. Yeah. But somebody put another clip of the original scene, which I kind of remember doing, but it was as much no. smaller version. There's right? actually a clip of the original scene? Yes. And uh, it was... Now, they told me when I cast me in it, they said that the, the guy didn't do a good job, the actor, I guess the... Who played the, the film professor? Is that what happened, I, or was it something else? I don't know, and I don't, I hate to shame anybody, so I'm sure he was great. I have to watch <laughs> it again, but I I actually don't know. I do know that it was this. It was the guy. the The scene was it was a huge room, and there was only a few of us in it, so it looked kind of vacant. And that was supposed and, to be a college, yeah, in and Atlanta, it, but we shot at UCLA. Yes, and so we shot it, I believe, originally at Agnes Scott, mm-hmm. and there was some lines, and there was, there wasn't as much as in the original. So then they kind of loaded it up, and they put Sarah in, and yeah. Josh Jackson, yeah. and Timothy, and they put a ton more people in it. Right, and then they put you, and we shot it for Atlanta in UCLA, and yeah. you were the professor, yeah. and it was much more closer and split diopters, and basically, in a nutshell, it looked much more. Uh, dynamic. So I don't know what the reason plus, was for the plus reshoot. The, plus, it was really snappy dialogue. It was really yeah, it was real it was, snappy. It was about about sequels. Yeah, and that's what 
the movie was a sequel within a sequel, so it was really cool. And I, I, I loved, I loved the scene. I remember one of the actors, he couldn't get his line right. He kept saying, um, it, 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 "See, unlike you, I have a ridiculous memory." I know, I have a great memory. Just certain things are gone. <laughs> He was supposed to. Say, he was supposed you couldn't to, fucking remember out there. What? Where? What I remember? Right out there, you couldn't remember the dude from Philly. So you stop it. You off, off air. You're like, who's that actor? <laughs> <laughs> All right, that is true. I cannot remember his name. It's gonna come to me. But uh, anyway, well, welcome to this podcast. It's uh, called Enlightened Up for a reason. Okay. Because don't you believe that uh, we really need a lot of this right now? We need a lot of laughter. It's a huge deal. Always. Yeah. We always need laughter. Yeah. It's like the one, that's like the thing that's in the world. Uh, one of the biggest problems is people just don't get the joke. And, and I also don't think that they get that it's great medicine. I mean, they say it, but there's no one literally subscribing or, you know, taking prescription drugs of, of laughter. There's nobody that's really, really de- doing a deep dive into this will make me well. You're right. I don't. I don't hear that. No. No. Oh. But yet we should. And I know you've been around comedy for years. Now let me ask you a, a strange question. We were talking earlier about how is your health usually? Like, are you a pretty healthy guy? Do you make it? Do you ever miss sets or or call in sick? <laughs> no, I'm a healthy guy. But I mean, I've had health issues in my past. But I've I've always got them fixed. But because I don't know if you knew this, but comedians are healthy just from being around laughter. If you look at the comedians, if they don't get into drugs and alcohol and all that kind of stuff, they live to 100 years old. George Burns, Don Rickles, uh, Milton Berle, Bob Hope. Uh, I mean, these are oh, all. That's yeah, a very Phyllis good point. Diller. That's a very, very good point. They're around the laughter. The energy makes you well. Wow. So stay with it, bro. You're one of the funniest guys out there. Stay uh, with it. That's a big compliment coming from you. Listen. And I appreciate it. I'm that. telling you, I told you this before. Your show, x mm-hmm. was literally one of the greatest shows in the history of television for reality shows of that ilk. I'd say it's the top one. It's better than any other show. You tell me a better show than that. Wow, Next. that's very nice of you. I mean, there's there's candid camera. There's definitely no, shows, but yeah, it of course there is. I was but happy. Listen, a Fanny Flag, <laughs> the original candy camera. Wait, Fanny Flag. She was in the original candid camera. I know that name. The Alan Funt. They weren't as funny as you. You played all these characters. I <laughs> see them to. all the time. You post them. You were unbelievable. You played a judge. I was howling, laughing. Thank I just. You. What does it take though? I don't have the balls to go through with these things that much. Why? It really takes just, just, just to go all the way with something. Well, you when can. Somebody's screaming or they're really upset. I'm, I'm, I go, no, no, I'm only kidding. I don't be me. But you, you like go all the way. I don't know how you do it. It's just big well, balls. Oh, thank you. And you, you could do it because you do characters. You do right. amazing characters. Yeah. So I wanted to do what you were doing and Eddie Murphy and different people doing characters. Yeah. But then. I wanted to kind of put them in a real setting. And the thing what about it was why it was so fun is because it was difficult to do it, but I knew the results were going to be great. And we were never we were never mean. I mean, sometimes we walked the line of like kind of edgy, but we were always the joke was pretty much big and wild and, and goofy and it was usually on me. Oh, and no. so I remember a wedding one. The yeah, the wedding one. Oh, oh that wedding one was a but that was a deep dive in the psychological of uh you can't even really talk about that one now. I'd probably get in trouble for that one now. Really? Yeah. Because, talking about it? Well, dude, I mean, come on, man. It was a lot of... Well, to tell the people. What can I know. tell? I don't even want to get in trouble. But you like, can't get in trouble. It's already out. <laughs> I know, but then you bring it up. Well, basically... Um, <laughs> it, was a, it was a person... Uh, I was playing a person. I was getting a guy. A guy who was getting married. <laughs> he met his wife on the internet. The internet wasn't as big as it was now. <laughs> and uh, the family was really excited for this new wife. And he just got out of the army. Me, and I was basically <laughs> trying to fool them if I was a full blown woman yet. That's all. And and I was like, I am. And you the way, well, I mean, the new I, world, I, man. I, I, love, I love you don't have the balls on my I, podcast <laughs> to tell a story that already happened. Well, you know what? When people get tell so, happened. so I basically, was, I played a guy. <laughs> I played a. I play. This guy was bringing home this beautiful new bride, and it was me. And I was trying to convince them that I was a woman. And I, the hard thing when I play women, I have these huge shoulders and a big schnoz, and they're like, "We're not sure, Darren." And he's like, "No, it's it's a woman." Then I was like, "All right, you caught me. I'm not there yet. I still have to fix some of the plumbing." 
And then <laughs> it was a big hit. People it loved was, it. But yeah. now they will probably be in trouble. No, no. Why? What is wrong with that? By the way, the, because the cancel culture, who are they? Have you ever met one that they're like, hi, uh, I'm with cancel they culture? They usually have blue hair. <laughs> no. They do. No, not older blue hair, like blue, like oh. they dye their hair blue. Oh, okay. I was going to say. <laughs> you never see. Old people, they're not even on. You know, no, this is the blue hair. So. Uh, but it's, 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 what it is, it's like people, people, it, it's the new thing is. The, I, I I equate it to this. People have a voice, and everybody should have a voice. The, the issue is with this the newest thing of the canceling stuff is that um, people have a are going to be offended by stuff. <laughs> people are going to be offended by stuff that they would always be offended by. That you just would never heard it. There's people that are always going to be offended at a Craig Schumacher joke in 1982. The problem is they didn't have a voice. To hear it, so you didn't hear it. You know what I'm saying? Well, they come up to you after the show as opposed to tweeting it out. No, I, they won't. You'll go to your clubs. You're killing. You're getting standing ovations. People love you. It's only now that you can take your clips, put them out, have them on multiple platforms, and somebody's going to discover it because everyone's seeing everything, and it's not going to like that. You did that. Right. But people that were absorbing you love you. At the time. Of course, and they still love you. Yeah. But it's this new thing of people are seeing stuff that normally wouldn't, but you comedy. Don't you think they're just more easily offended and it's his virtue signaling like, oh, look at me. Look what I'm offended by because you know what? They can wait for the next joke. Just wait. There's another one coming. It's not going to offend you. Like two seconds later, why do you have to say, why do they have to say something? I've never met anybody with the club. Is there a club? No, no, it's, it's, um, it's, 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 look, there's a, Thing that is happening now, our culture should shift, right? We should get better. We've had a lot of things that are not Absolutely. great, but we've also had a lot of great things, right? Yeah. And so we should grow and get better. We're evolving, which is good. The issue is, is that um, you're saying that people, people should wait for the next joke. It's not about that. It's about when somebody, vir you said a lot of stuff. So virtual signaling to me I always wonder about those because people who shout the loudest, what's in their closet? Exactly right. They're, little, they're usually projecting something that they're guilty of. Yes, exactly. Almost everyone that's the case. Yeah, so there's, there's people that are super loud. I'm like, mm, mm, you know, no, it's like this. But, I mean, look, obviously we have to get better, but not everything is terrible either. So it's like people are throwing out the bathwater with the baby and the tub and the bathroom, and the bathroom never existed. So, I mean, no, is there a group? Sure, there's tons of groups you can find, but... I don't think the majority is as huge as it's projected through the media. I think it's the reason it exists is because corporations allow it. There's a little chirping. Yeah, the little chirping, that's enough for a corporation to yes. take something down. So but that th doesn't make any sense to me because it's a 1%. 1% of people, and by the way, those same people will use your product anyway. They're not going to stop using a product. Because they were offended by something. They're, they might, for a few minutes, yes. let it go. Let it ride. I, but, but corporate, everyone's in fear right now. Yeah, there's a, a lot of fear. You're right. And it's like, that's why we have to Diana, do our own thing. I mean, I love playing the big pool, but, you know, like, like you're doing now. We have to, the only thing we really have is the audience. And that's for everybody. That's just for singers, dancers, actors, not just comics. We have to cultivate our audience and people that go with us. Because if not, at any, I've never felt in my life that it could just go away. And I feel like that now. I feel like there's zero forgiveness. Yeah. Well, you're going through something. I wanted to bring this up. You're going through something right now. You're in a movie mm -hmm. that would obviously... There's the old tag of liberal Hollywood and liberal media, right? There's mm. a tag. I believe in that somewhat. I don't believe in it as much as other people do with that mass, you know, a tag that they do put on it. But it tends to be, it trends to be liberal. And you're in a movie that's the opposite. You're in a movie that's about Roe v. Wade. Mm -hmm. And you play a real character. Mm -hmm. Tell us about it. I'm in a movie. It's called Roe v. Wade. It was originally called 1973, and it's basically a courtroom drama with dramatic flashbacks of how uh, the court case and how that whole decision came down. And the issue about it is, is that I took the role because I've said this to multiple outlets that it was a very nice offer. It was a respectful offer, and it was a role. 
of a guy that is a hero to the left. It's a guy. It's a guy that's one of the pioneers of Planned Parenthood. Um, but what's there was his, what's his name? His name is Larry Later. And is there he was, alive today? No, he he passed. And there was he comes from the line of uh, the long lineage of feminism. A woman named Margaret Sanger, who's like one of the OG feminists. Oh, absolutely. Yeah. And then you know Betty Friedan and him hung out. And I mean these are before Gloria Steinem. And so he was in the movement of the women. And then and this was an offer, by the way, not an audition. A straight offer. Wow. And yes, exactly. Of course, but by people, the way, during COVID, no, it was before COVID. Oh, it was, it was okay. a couple of years ago. Oh, okay. And it, it was just came out recently. It just came out now, and it was they've been trying to release it, and nobody wanted to buy it, and you know all this stuff. So, but the thing is, is that people are thinking it's uh, right wing propaganda, and I'm not right wing. Not everybody in the movie is uh, right. Or but right, they found some that or, coincidentally were, or maybe not by coincidence. Yeah, no, there's definitely people Robert that are. Robert Davi is heavy, you know, but known it, as that, right? But Robert Davi's a great guy. Right. I've spent m multiple dinners I'm with not, him. I'm not saying no, he's no, not. no. I'm he, saying, but like, that's the what I'm saying. The perception is, is if he's in it, or John Voight, or who, who else is in it? There's tons of people: John Voight, Stacey Dash, Joey Lawrence. Oh, okay. Well, those um, are Tom known, Gearney. They're known as, uh, but not know. all of them. Tom Gearney's from the Sandlot. I mean. Yeah. Look, there's a mix of people. Octavius Prince is a young actor, in it, and he's also one of the producers. So, look, it's a movie, and it's about something, and it's a role that's different for me. So I thought, why not go into it? Why not be a part of something that's important, that's a real topic? But instead, people just think I'm helping to reinforce bad right-wing Propaganda and well, let's 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 use this as an example. There, there's a cancel but there, culture. But wait, I'm just, let me finish my thought. Okay, yeah. But there is some right wing, probably propaganda in there for sure. But there's also other things that facts that people may not want to accept. And then there's also everything is propaganda. There's course, <laughs> there's yeah. propaganda on the left. So go ahead. Sorry. Yeah. Well, I mean, I think it's a great example of who's out there trying to cancel you, though. Just, just like fans are coming. No, off. no one's trying to. No one's trying to cancel me. You know per what se. I'm saying? They're Don't even they're... say it. <laughs> Jesus Christ! No, it's Jamie more. Jamie like, Kennedy has been canceled, no, folks, and he's, oh, it, he's it, down to doing Craig it, Shoemaker's. Podcast. It would be fascinating. That's actor it. canceled for acting. Um, <laughs> right. It. It's more not like that. It's more like the Daily Beast, which I'm very proud of. That they. They. I'm very lucky that they interviewed me. They did a whole interview with me, and it was very nice. And they basically kind of skewered the story. In a way that it made it look like I don't, you know, I was, you know, f I don't know, really know the facts about abortion and such. And then a lot of people jumped on and was like, how dare this guy do this movie? He is, mm. you know, so people really, so there was people that would, you know, in that facet. Or faction or whatever. Every, every one of them. They were coming every out. They were coming them. out like, every how single, the fuck are you doing this movie? Every single one of them would have taken the part if they were offered. Every one of them. I, I, I yeah. That's the a lot of people. Signalers. A lot that, of they, they're, they're, That's who they are. Yeah, I don't know any of them. Like, I mean, there's definitely people that are weird. It's weird that they're actors and comedians. Some of them, who I don't really know, but it's like, yo, we're in the same game. It's like you're kind of like. Oh, they tweeted about it. And it's like artist on artist. Crime, you know what I mean? That's and the problem I have with comics for a long time. That's bizarre we should to me. All be in the same brotherhood, we are. sisterhood. We are. We should be, but we're not. And people, either, that's bizarre to and, me. You know, and by the way, this is another thing in politics. It happens all the time, probably more so on the left. But they eat their own. It's just ridiculous. You know what they did? To even Al Franken. Al, oh. Al Franken. This guy was run up the river, and for way less than most people would do. You know. I mean, it's just amazing to me. And and there's no trial. There's no due process. Yeah. And you, you just... And Al get, didn't even fight back. What's that? Al didn't fight back. Didn't fight back, yeah. Should have fought back. No. He, he just... He, he left and uh, maybe could have something to do with... Maybe he had more... <laughs> maybe he had be, some dirt. Maybe more was going to be revealed. But the bottom line is we should all protect one another. I, and to a point... I yeah, mean, obviously, I if mean, people there, are bad, then a, it's There's difference. a couple of... Uh, you know, that have been accused. But even that, you're not really sure. Let's do the due process first and then make a decision. I hate even that. talking about this shit. It's <laughs> fucking uncomfortable. It's so uncomfortable. <laughs> no, I mean, I, Jamie, I actually love talk. I, I watch your uh, podcast. Thank you. And it's, um, 
It's provocative. You do talk about things. Maybe not this. I do. I do just want to make sure I'm really informed with certain stuff. And like, with, it's hard when I talk to somebody because then they may say something, and then it's like, if I don't subscribe to certain, then the people align you with it. This has to do with the cancel culture and the virtue signaling, all that's going on. If you don't have the conversations, then you stay in fear. If you don't have the conversations about what's going on with the pandemic, maybe there are some things that we should discuss. But you can't just say. No, conspiracy theorists, that, that label is put on to people. And you know why it's put on? Because the people who are hiding things want to put that on there. They, t they tag it, and then nobody listens anymore to somebody like Jeffrey Wigand or Aaron Brockovich. These are brave people that were also conspiracy theorists at one time. They're whistleblowers. I, I agree with you that, that, that I hate the term conspiracy theorists. Oh. As you know, I say that on my podcast. It, oh, should, just be, it should just be like... Mm, alternative theory you know what i mean like it's already dismissing them as like somebody and, they're, and it's 100 percent right like you know there's a lot of conspiracies that are considered crazy but they are kind of coming into light as truthful i mean i'm not going to go down the rabbit hole so don't <laughs> go there because you'll get I've, does I've, this go on youtube I, i'm gonna be honest with you what's happened to me today what? I'm really, and this is this isn't a knock on you. Yeah. I'm a little surprised at the amount of fear. You're one of the fearless people that I've ever met. No, no but it's, there's there seems to be. Listen, just listen to me. Just listen to me. All right. Let's take this in. I am noticing today that there's been even before we came on. No, we won't talk about that. We won't talk about that. It's 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 amazing to me what has happened in society where Jamie Kennedy even is subjected to fear, where where you're actually buying some of it. It's not that I buy it. It's just that the powers that be. Because you're afraid of the powers that be. I'm not afraid of them. I'm just it's, just, it's just, dude, I, you got to fucking survive, man. And they're fucking come. People will come for you if you say some shit. So there you, you go. go. That's so the tr truth. But the, so that's true then. Well, yeah, I, I'm, a f I don't want to have to deal with the, with the drama but if it and also yeah it also it's like are, are, is let's talk about this is this podcast worth me dealing with a lot of drama are the views going to be that huge <laughs> do you know what i mean of course there's some fucking fear of the way the world is don't you agree with that even in my own podcast are the views worth enough i just, I, just I never watch myself i don't know if you do i watched myself yesterday on something because it popped up yeah i was looking for sleep meditation and my fucking mug pops up Yes. Me interviewed on Jim Norton's show. Yes. Talking about, and it's the same sort of thing. I was talking about some famous people and stuff like that. And as I'm looking, I'm going, oh, those people are never going to work with you. <laughs> or anybody seeing this, they're going to go, uh, I don't want to work with that guy. <laughs> yes. so, so sometimes it's our livelihood that is going to be affected. If you have, like, if you're going to work for Disney, they'll look you up and they'll find something. They'll go up. If it's, a, if it's a tie between somebody real clean. 100%. You, yeah, that's that's why a lot of comedians, though, we're truth tellers. This is the irony or this is the dichotomy that we go through is we want to be truth tellers. That's what the best comedy is, the best art is. That's why Bill Burr is at the top of his game right now. Major truth teller. Mm -hmm. Does not care. Mm -hmm. Amazing. Does not care. Top. Doesn't have the fear. And that's, where I'm, that's what I'm saying is, you know, and they, by the way, people with money, though, they, they turn their heads to people like him. That's what they do. If the person makes money, they'll turn their head. I remember one time I was in Kansas City as a stupid example, but um, I made one little mistake. You know, I, I, asked, I asked about the numbers. I said that their numbers were off because I was getting a bonus. Mm -hmm. And they go, oh, we're not going to use him again. They got really mad at me. Meanwhile, the week before, a really famous comic smoked in the room at, you know what I mean? In the hotel room, mm. got fines out the ass, and he's booked three weeks later. You know what I mean? Mm. But they'll turn their head if it's somebody that makes them money. That's the way people are. But you're on the chopping block if you don't make money for people. Yeah, it's true. Yeah, as soon as Bill Burr's career goes down a little bit, suddenly, oh, that was, look what he said. I guarantee that's what's going to happen. Happened to Louis C.K. Right? Yeah, I mean, I, it, it's an intense time. You yeah. know what I mean? Oh, yeah. And it's like, where do you want to be on the, it's like, there's a way to tell truth. You can tell the truth on stage. You, you got to like make sure as long as you're in control of your truth. And so I'm only in control of part of it. And you have your own thing that you're saying. So we have to like vibe with it. But right, right. it's like, you know, I mean, dude, it's it's uh, intense out there. Like you, you can't even say certain words on YouTube. 
Really? Yes. Where does this podcast go? YouTube. <laughs> Dude, you can't say certain things. You what, get you get you what get, words can't you say? Uh you you can't talk about the vax. Oh. You can't talk about COVID. They'll put like little disclaimers up. You can't talk so You ab- just did though. So I use code word, I use code happen? words. No, you just said COVID and Yeah, vax. so you're going to get flagged for this. <laughs> really? You, yeah, you'd have to take it off. Seriously. They they will have it. They have AI that looks at it. Oh, that is crazy. <laughs> it just depends on where you want to play in the pool. Do you want to play in mainstream Hollywood or mm. do you want to not play mainstream Hollywood? Where do you want to play? Mm. That's a really good question. Well, I, I like to that. do my own thing, but I still want to have the door open. And that's sure. the only reason I'm a little p- bitch ass at times because it's like, yo, man. But I think the do- I think the whole building might burn soon. Yeah. That's my opinion. I think it might just burn. I think it's, every- it's like you just said. We're all either going to be working for Disney or have a Patreon. And that's it. Everything else is going to be done. Well, comics really, they're, we're the first to go. I mean, yeah, you're well, right, well, which is crazy. F- FCC, right? yeah. So now the government's after you. Oh, right, that's been going on for years. Yeah. They, they, you could have a drug company that's probably going to get me off of YouTube too. Big Pharma can sponsor an ad about vaginal warts or poorly timed to be a bad, you know, erections and defunct, whatever. Right? Mm-hmm. They can say anything, and then you can see death. You can talk about death counts and everything else, beheadings, anything you want on television if it's sponsored by big bucks. Mm-hmm. I've been on more morning shows where they freak out. If you if I said the word boner mm-hmm. or erection on a morning show, they mm-hmm. would boot me off so fast. Mm-hmm. So there's a sensitivity with comedians that doesn't exist with anyone else. There's no other art form. There's no other occupation. We are the first to go. We yeah. should be the people that we they listen to. It's the opposite. So then you got the cancel culture on both sides, by the way, yep. right and left, wanting to cancel us. So it's a really bad situation. That's why I kind of agree with you. It's all going to just blow up. I do. I really believe that it's going to blow up because it's there's so so. How many award shows? The ratings keep dying, and how many people really go to Hollywood for their answers? People are making their own content. They're doing YouTube. They're doing TikTok. And I'm not saying it's. You know, a big movie, but people are fucking happy with it. They're expressing themselves. There's a lot of creative people in the world, and it's just too much preachiness coming out of Hollywood. Oh yeah. So it's and like, by the way, they, there's no comedy category in the Oscars. You ever notice that? Yeah, I know that. There's Mar- no comedy performances are ever. I mean, some of the the, the best performances yeah. are comedians, and yet they'll have uh, best uh, documentary short uh, editing. You know, I mean, like stuff that no one cares about. And here's these comedians. They only use us to be hosts yeah, and presenters. Yeah. You know, oh, let's let's put the jesters up there. That that we're okay with. But we can't. They're, they're, they're so below us. You, you, know. you, you make a very valid point there, bro, which is, is and, and you, 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 you know because you're a trailblazer for me. You know what I mean? You've been doing this 10 years longer than me. Yeah. And you were humongous in Philly, and then you won Comedian of the Year. That's incredible. So I look up to you, learning from you about this. And to st- and Mark Lanau, who one of the owners of the Improv, always talked about how comedy is. Um, it's 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 it was too it was too they were too cavalier about it, and I agree. It it is weird, and if you think about it, com- comedians are almost, um, what's the term, afterthought of like, oh, like, it's, disres- it's disrespected Very a lot. I think, I, think, yeah. I think it's becoming much more huge because of, you know, the geniuses of Bill Burr and, you know, Chappelle and the, and the such, you know what I mean, who really are these orators of truth, you know? But would they be invited to a corporate meeting uh, of the minds, a mastermind, would a comedian be included in that? No. May, We're considered the court jester. Uh, amuse me, fool. Yes, but... And but, then there's the... I, but with that, which yeah. is annoying in Hollywood is you have like these, it was a very brave and bold performance. Right. She was a woman in a mountain. You know, and it's like... Yeah. But like a guy getting killer laughter, a lady doing killer... You know, so I will say Melissa McCarthy has broken down a lot of doors. She's got a few... Uh, I think she has at least one Oscar nomination. And maybe it was a drama. 
But it probably was. But but what I'm saying is she she's, probably played somebody with an affliction. P- possibly, if you but have an affliction that's an automatic. But yeah, your comedy in general should be respected more, and it's and it and it's very disrespectful. Robin Williams won for a dramatic. Role. He yes, but he at least he won. You know, and and the thing is, is that. But you're right. It it, it the, the thing is, is that people. For, it's like when they come up to you and they think they're funny. You know, and it's like you could be funny, but don't like disrespect it. Like it's so hard to do comedy, and I mean, like you I'm said, not, to be honest is really hard. Yeah, we're not whining here, but but we are considered uh, like less than any other creative artist. I think we should be at the head of the heap. Like, uh, you know, we don't get reviewed. You know what gets reviewed? No, they Musici- get reviewed. No, re- musicians get reviewed. Theater gets reviewed. Netflix reviews comedians, dude. Net- I mean, not Netflix. Comedians, rev- I mean, people review There's Netflix no specials. There's no Siskel and Ebert, you know, that we grew up with. There's no Siskel and Ebert for comedy. But Comedians don't get reviewed in comedy clubs. It just doesn't happen. In clubs, no, but specials get reviewed. Yeah, but, but yes, of course they do because they're on television. Mm-hmm. It's just a new form. But but all the bottom line is there are no reviewers. There's a reviewer for film. It's yeah. All, the most famous reviewers around, that's for film or theater. You know, they would open up the, the next day. They'd open up the New York Times to see how the play would do. Yeah, all based on the reviews. Yeah, we don't have that happen with comedy. They it, won't even bother with comedy. It's it's. I do think com- comedians who are fans of us are becoming more voracious and zealous, and they know what you're saying and they agree with it. That's like they need it and they need the truth. But there is a uh, there is a hoity toity that comedy had to put up with for a long time and i never understood it either i never understood it to me making someone laugh is one of the hardest things ever to do um also it's harder because you can make yourself look like a fool for your benefit that's super confident Mm -hmm. but then people actually think you're a fool they're just not as intelligent to realize no we're just doing that for your benefit and you know what big actors that i've talked to really do admire comedians because they know they can't do this I've seen a couple make the transition. I and I'll I'll check around. Don't drop names, Jesus Christ. Why? Cause you fucking wanted to get everybody pissed off. Just no, walk around. The I, was gonna, I, was gonna, I was gonna drop a name on a good way. <laughs> okay, drop a name on a good way. I heard he's great. Who? Jeremy Piven. Oh, he's great. He's I heard great. He made the transition, and but I I check these things out to see if these actors. Can make the transition. Many can't, and I won't name them, Jamie, because I want to be on Disney. Geez, he, no, he's great, but he's a I natural. He's, he's been a performer his whole life. I, I mean, know he's he great. Has. He yeah. grew up in the business and yeah. his parents and everything. But still, I don't care who how he was brought up. It is a very difficult transition, and apparently, he's doing it. Yeah, look, I mean, look at. There's no gateway into comedy, which is good and possibly bad, right? Anybody can start to do comedy. You know, we, you're not the guard of comedy. No one is. But there are people that just think it's easier than it is, you know. Um, and again, I don't like talking about people, but someone like Jeremy does go out every night, works on it, rewrites, rewrites. I mean, he's a real student of the game, and he's yeah. naturally, you know, a fucking brilliant performer. Right. So yeah. it's going to work. But there are people that, you know, think they are funny if they're funny at the local fucking, you know, Chipotle. Uh, That's different. <laughs> but- now, did you start in Philadelphia did, uh, doing open mic? I don't know what no. the comedy factor. No, I remember. See, not many people know that. that that's the OG reference right there. Comedy <laughs> factor. Is um, I probably had a, a hundred OG references just in this interview. Yeah, you did. So, so, so um, uh, yeah, I do not remember you in the clubs. Uh, no, I didn't start there. I started in LA, but you did. Yeah, I, did it couldn't. Have, I couldn't have started in Philly. Why? Where are you from? What part of Philly? Uh, I'm from Mount Airy. Do you know Mount Airy? Mount Airy. <laughs> oh, um, well, we could do Philly accent. Hey, the rest, the rest of course of the I show. did. So, okay, so let me ask you: Why did you start comedy? Really, quick, quick answer. Uh, pain. Okay, pain. Yeah, obviously. Oh yeah, we blew over that whole abduction thing. Which, oh, know. that's nothing. I okay. mean, I have a lot of stuff. You have a lot of suicide. Stuff. Okay, you know, death. Jesus. Okay, I'm died, very sorry. I died once. Don't be sorry. All right, I'm not sorry. I, I'm. I'm, no, I'm letting you know. <laughs> All the stuff. I'm happy that all of this happened. I'm happy poverty happened. Did you? Okay. I'm happy all of it happened. Did you have two? I love my life today. Do you have two parents? No, I mean that's the okay. That's whole part. My so, dad's a cult leader. Did you know that? No, I had the no Pocono idea. Pocono Mountains of Pennsylvania. I didn't know Remember half of this shit. No, um, I I couldn't have started in Philly because too many people in Philly knew me. 
And if I was... Oh, no. Really? Oh, yeah. So, so, so And if I was trying to do fucking comedy in Philly, like, I kind of was popular. People fucking knew who I was. So if I started doing comedy, it would be like, yeah, you think you're fucking better than us? Hey, you think he's, you? He's doing the best Philly accent. You which think no you, one can do? By you the think way. you can? Fu- you don't need to take a job down at the fucking auto mall. You don't need to take a job at the fucking UPS. You know, so P- it, doing comedy was equivalent of going to the fucking moon, dude. And so I had to totally leave I Philly. That, I thought this had to do with also you're afraid to talk about them. You're afraid mm, to talk about like, like relatives. I po- mean, that, my, my mom had a restraining order on. On a bit that I did, it was a true story. Oh my god! Yeah, I got a letter from the law firm, Decker Price and Rhodes. There, there it was, <sighs> telling dropped. me to stop talking about her belly dance in my high school graduation party. I said it's a true story, so you can't sue me. But anyway, so Jesus. I thought that's what you meant—that you're worried about your neighbor saying, uh, you know, hey, that's not me. Come on, no. I'll kick your ass after the show. That's a great accent too. <laughs> it was more of just like I had to basically. You go to L.A. And you reinvent yourself. That's amazing. And that's why I did it. And I, I couldn't even start in New York. But you have to understand is New York was too close. I didn't know I was going to be a comedian. I, I had no idea. And you all moved these, out here to be an actor. It kind of. I just moved out here to matter. Like I moved out to L.A. because I was like I did some extra work in Philly. And that's a whole other 10 hour podcast. But by that I was like. Extra work in movies? Yes. Tell, tell me a movie. You're an extra. Uh, long story short I was an extra in Dead Poets Society. Robin ah, Williams movie, yes. But that wasn't filmed in Philly. It was filmed in Delaware, which is, you know, the tri-state area. Oh, I didn't know that. So, so my friend's mother was a local actress, knew I wanted to be an actor, introduced me to this. What's fucking, her name, by the way? Her name is Ginny Graham, God rest her soul, wonderful person. And yeah. she had a big commercial in Philly with Bill Berge. Yeah. Um, and no, so I remember G- her. Jiffy Lube, probably. I studied at Wee Sparing with her. You know, Wee Sparing. Oh, you probably did. The Wee Sparing talent agency. So you know her. Also in acting school. See, we, I never knew any of this, but you, we, t- Todd, we're, we're Elena DeSantis. Oh yeah, <laughs> so. but Todd, but but Todd Rungren was from my That's, neighborhood. Yeah, uh, John Capoletti, who was a professional football player. Penn you know, State. you were coming out. Uh, Ed McMahon and Dick Clark. That was before my time, but right. Philly had a, a a thing. You know, you can't mean his name up anymore. But Bill Cosby was from Philly. You know, <laughs> and so all this stuff was there, and so. Hall I was Oates, Bob Saget. Hall and all too. Bob, of course, Bob Saget. Yeah. So all of these different people were coming out, and you had to kind of come out. It wasn't like today where you could do something in your town and kind of put it on the internet. So long story short is I got that, and I said, like, where are the extra work? And so I thought, where is it easier to struggle? So I moved to L.A. because it was sunny, and it was far. And so, and I, like, had to get a GTE card in the late eighties. And it was like, you only had X amount of minutes for long distance calls. <laughs> and so I started trying to become an extra and then I learned it was a long road, but then I only after enough jobs of like, you know, shitty day jobs people were like, you should try stand up. And I was always a fan. Wow. And then I started, and then I started signing up on open mics and that's, it never you looked did back. Open mics out here in Los Angeles, Tons. which is difficult Tons. because everyone is out here. That's why it's easier in Philly. The open mics, you got like yeah, know, but you could, a competition of five people. Yes. Here it's like 500 people are trying to get a spot. And is it, and is it good and bad to that? Because I know comedians, young comedians that are really good, and they come out here and they have a tight 15 because they destroyed it in their local town. Mm-hmm. And I would say that's a very healthy thing to do. Um, but also, I was in the biggest pool in the world, so I was able to be, like you could rise to the top of your town, and then you can come to L.A. and no one gives a fuck. So it was easier for me to go and just sign up at the potluck at the store at the improv. At least I was there with movie stars and TV stars. You know what I'm saying? But I was also playing coffee houses. I was playing Tony Rome with lounge lounges. I mean, I was fucking anywhere. Radisons anywhere. YMCA's. Yeah. Who was? Who would you say is your compadre who came up at the same round around the same time, <sighs> and they made it as well as you did? Your one o'clock in the morning doing spots at the, you know, the Ha Ha Room or whatever it is. Who? Who are your contemporaries in your generation? It's kind of crazy because I kind of started before a lot of people and a lot of people fell out and a lot of people didn't make it. But people that kind of started a little after me, uh, there was a place on Pedersons called Pedersons Mm -hmm. and Pedersons Coffee Roasters was great. It was before Starbucks. It was 93 and I used to perform there every Tuesday and it was, it was awesome, dude. It was imagine a Starbucks with a microphone, but people wanted to laugh comedy. And, uh, you know, 
people that the hero of the circuit for me was Brian Holtzman. Uh, Brian Holtzman was the funniest, wildest man. He's amazing. But he never quite uh, he's, became a household He's a name. legend, but he's, you know, he's not really known outside of the comedy community. Mm. He's, a, he's a legend. Um, uh, and then Sherry Shepard started coming on a lot. Yeah. Um, Eric Griffin. He came on at that time. There's a lot of people that didn't like come on, and there's other people that are still struggling. Uh, but I mean, it's it's hard. There was, and I was, I was. There's so many young, cool people in comedy now, like and, and like cute. Like you know who the cute young female comic was, was when I started? Me, uh, me. <laughs> like there was, I was like the youngest. You know what I mean? And yeah. then and like comedy wasn't cool. It was a freak show. And Natasha it was, Leggero. Natasha was after me. Yeah, that's right. She um, was like early 2000s. Yeah. yeah. I'm talking the early 90s. Uh, yeah. And uh, it was, it wasn't like, com- it wasn't glamorous. The boom of the 80s happened. It was done. Mm-hmm. A lot of your generation was like, it's never going to be repeated. Mm-hmm. And it was like, but it became this new thing with the, you know, I watched the coffee houses and I went through that. And that's when all, I mean, the people that were ahead of me was David Cross's and Janine Garofalo's mm. and Sarah Silverman's. But they were always, I believe, a few grades ahead of me. I was younger and, and less experienced than they were. But I got to, like, go in coffee houses and, like, watch them and, like, try to sign up on the open mics and stuff. But it was, it was, I loved it. I and loved st- it. And you still love comedy. You have a real passion for comedy. Um, stand up. If I could really in it, stand up, yeah. If I could, here's what I love, and I, I'm gonna say some stuff, and I'm gonna walk around it because you still have to be political, even though you think say everything. So we have to edit some shit. <laughs> so here, we upstairs. Now that you're making me aware of these algorithms, well, I'm fuck so, I'm frightened dude. To say let me fucking words. help you. What's your man's name again? Gordon. Gordon. Yeah. Gordon. We're gonna have to talk. So, um, <laughs> so look, here's what's crazy about. So here's one of these things that this pandemic has done. It has made entrepreneurs and I believe artists thrive. And the, the community has coalesced. Like I work with comics in different parking lots and all this stuff now that I may have never known. And I mean everyone, like from, you know, the top of the fucking mountain, Burr, down to like open micers. Everybody does different shows, right? And you could come out if you want to go out and do them, right? Every, everyone's mixing up. But these entrepreneurial bookers will put these new shows together. And I have done a couple shows outside of the system where I have made very good money. And it's because people wanted to pay. They aligned my fans, and it was wonderful. Now that things are opening up, I'm getting these offers, and my agent doesn't know this. And I'm like, I want to have this combo. I'm like, dude, this model is going to be gone like i need that real cut of that real door or we're not gonna do it so i love comedy but i want to do it on my terms now that's why i want to talk more i want to podcast i'm not in there to doing the fucking dinner entertainment how about anymore. one how about one person shows no i have no desire to do that i just want to be able really? to use my voice it doesn't have to be anything it could just be me showing up somewhere you can show up now and sell 150 tickets at some converted gas station I can't believe you're saying this. And I'm I'm about that. I life. just talked to an agent. He said this is what's going to happen now. Is on a Tuesday night when people thought they had to go out on a weekend. No. It'll be any night of the week because 100%. COVID changed everything. hundred percent. So now you 100%. can actually literally play a Starbucks. hundred percent. Whatever it is. Keep the door. Yeah. People are gonna want to go out. Yeah. And that's the only thing I have the issue with is the money is gone Ooh. no it hasn't oh the money will go up well it might go up but and here's the other issue you have to cultivate have. the shoemaker fans well i another problem is the stadium acts are now playing the clubs yeah and then the stadiums will open again yeah well here's the thing is that dude there are shows popping up all over the place. That's what I'm saying. But it's they're not ex- for money, though. I've, that's I've not. Tr- but not all of them are for money. You work your bits out, but some of them can be. You can you sell a hundred tickets in um in Bakersfield? Yeah, of course. Could you sell if you sold a hundred tickets at thirty bucks a ticket? Would you make the drive? That's pretty low money. 
compared to the old days. Maybe I made more money than you. <laughs> no, I've made great money. But what I'm saying is, wait, I'm saying, wait, hold on. You went, okay, you want to be, you went to fucking West Palm Beach and did a show during COVID. How much money was there? How, how did you know that? Because you told me I, that. I, I did. But you, great brain, remember you said <laughs> super memory? Come on, you... There's a, How do you know what I made there? I don't know what you made, but I know what I make there. And I'm saying during COVID, limited seating, you're not going to make a lot of money. That's to, right. To drive That's an exactly hour right. for Bakersfield to play 100 people at 3Gs wouldn't be terrible. You'd probably do two shows at six grand. Is that Would you throw six grand on the ground and not pick it up? No. Exactly. I drive to Bakersfield. And it's it an hour away. <laughs> you an got hour. on a flight to go to Florida. <laughs> Come All on, right. where's your logic you on that? Be my agent. <laughs> See, that's what I'm saying. That's what we should do. We should form agencies. Oh, it's just, too much work. Just with comedians. By the way, we, like share, you know, like sharecroppers. So some of the best money I ever made were colleges and corporates. Oh God, yeah. dude, colleges are done. I know. And corporates are. Corporates are really tough too. So the money I, you're I making. Had, I had people fired for a show that I did. Five people were fired who booked me. Let's talk. Okay. Horrible. That's the HR gets a hold dude, of it. Dude, oh, that's incredible. That their only job, HR, now there, those are cancel culture people. Yes. Those are the leaders of can is HR people. But stay back on the money because yeah. I want you to get okay. expired. I've made great money in clubs on off nights. The money now is not going to be handed to you. You have to earn it. Oh, God. You have to sell every so goddamn ticket. What I'm saying is you really have your fans, Dattitude, and all everything else you've done. You could go to a place on a Tuesday night and sell 100 tickets. Yeah. I am doing that. 200 tickets. Yes, coming up. God, that's what I am doing. It's just a little rough to see less money coming in. But look, we have, I call this a spiritual rebooty call. That's what we're in right now. We're in a big, <laughs> we're a big rebooty call in the world, period. <laughs> And we're all in it. A rebooty call. Yes. Let's talk about Philadelphia for a minute. <laughs> I have a uh, a problem. And now, again, I'm going to bring up actors that you probably won't do this. But nobody does a Philadelphia accent in movies. No, they do. Name one. Apparently, it's really good. Uh, Kate Winslet is playing somebody from Dalco. It's a series I on actually, HBA. I on HBO. I actually stopped by the set. Yeah, oh, you uh, did. Yeah. Of course you did. You I, are fucking the mayor of Philly. I, I, you know, they have a huge studio. And I don't know if you knew this. Well, HBO, HBO is there filming with Kate Winslet. She's it's apparently a doing. studio. She's doing a thing. Yeah, she's doing the Philly accent. Kate Winslet. Apparently, and apparently it's amazing. But she said it was very difficult to, to oh. get. She, oh, so she talked about so it. So like regional, yeah. Well, you know that no one's done one in the history of film. Name one. Silver Linings Playbook. Even even Bradley Cooper's from there did not do it. De Niro did a New York accent. They yeah. all do a New York accent. I mean, I did one in this movie I did last call, but it's me. So I could just put it on. Oh, right. Tell me about that movie. Jeremy Piffin, speaking of Piffin. that, isn't it? Yeah. That's so funny that I brought him up. Yes, he stars in it. He this stars movie. in it. It's called Last it's Call. It's called Last Call. It's about, I'll give you a quick story. So it's about a kid named Greg Lingo, who was like a kid I grew up in the neighborhood, who became very successful, amazing athlete. Went to Cornell, uh, made a lot of money, and he loves Philly. He's like you, but he he never left. You left. He just fucking pumps it back into the community. He is like Philly through and through. Yeah, Eagles, Sixers, all that stuff. And um, he wanted to make a movie, so we made it about I want to say Collie's Tavern or another one on Westchester Pike, right mm -hmm. by Pekas. And it was basically about a guy that, you know, do you sell the local family bar and gentrify the neighborhood? Yeah. Or do you... Nice plot. That's nice. Yeah. Or do you, yeah. or do you, you know, keep the right. the, the, the familiar feeling alive? And right. one of the characters is based on his brother. I, one of them, I, my character is based on a guy that grew up with Paul. And Bruce Dern's in it. You know, plays like an older drunk. Jack Gallagher. I mean, amazing. Captain Jack Moriarty. Gallagher? Yeah, Jack Gallagher. The comedian? No, Jack Gallagher, the actor. Oh, okay. He's in. Uh, he was in. He's a million things, but he was in The Shield. He's amazing. Moriarty's in it. Kathy. Kathy Moriarty. Moriarty's in it. Wow. Taryn Manning. It's like. Does she, she try the Philadelphia accent? No, she's got a New York accent. Kathy Moriarty played a Greek mother, which is very common, like you know. Yeah. Greek people in Philly, so it has a very good vibe. And then there's local Philly actors that are hilarious. This kid Peter Peter's in it. Do they do? The but they accent? do it. They're, but that's who they are. I put it on in the movie, but you know, I'm from there. So it's you ever watched like uh, all of those movies it's on iTunes and Amazon Prime right now? 
Go ahead. What's the name of it again? It's called Last Cool. It's actually doing very well. IFC Films. That's awesome. And I like to t- t- be in stuff. And um, I don't know if I will be after this podcast because of Craig. <laughs> but I'm a bitch. <laughs> You're going to go. I'm a bitch. I'm not scared, bro. I'm fucking tact, 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 tactful. What is the word? <laughs> You have to be a tactician. A tactician, yeah. Tactician. You're definitely not tactful. <laughs> <laughs> the, uh, but the Philadelphia accent, uh, I cannot believe even Invincible. They were all New York. Uh, Dove Davidoff, they're all New York actors doing a New York accent. Oh, I didn't know that. Watch Invincible. I got to watch it. Tony Luke is in it, and he does. Tony Luke, God, he, he sent me some steaks. He did? Amazing steaks, dude. Over, oh, I, I ate know. fucking during the pandemic. He hooked me up because of he? you. Thank you. Oh man, you just ride my coat. I do. I, I ride think, your. I think hardcore. you dated someone that I dated. I know we won't say that. We name. had a couple of dinners. But the thing is, that would not. make me. That would make way beyond. That. It would make me look good, but no. Let's keep that on the DL. Well, we're gonna keep it on the DL. But no, she was a very sweet, sweet. You gotta we had give a couple that of sweet. up. Okay, you've had a lot of. Uh, I've had a lot of shoemaker. Uh, yeah. So. Yeah. Now, influences. Jennifer Love Hewitt was my ex, also. Really? How did you? No, I'm just in kidding. between I'm you just, and I'm just, I'm just kidding. <laughs> I'm just kidding. <laughs> It's crazy. Jamie, I want to go back to our conversation. There's nothing wrong with this. Yeah. Is it one time you wanted to have a family? You were talking to me about having a family. Yeah. Where are you with that today? It's a very good question. Um, I think it's, uh, it, it, dude, it's so, I'll give you the two cent version of it. It's like, I never thought of marriage or no? girlfriends or any of that when I was coming up. No. I was like, because, you know, Dr. Drew told me this, that you, if you have a, you know, I didn't have like a, 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 a like a a base that was like super loving. I mean, I had a loving base, but not like a. Uh, Talking about your home life. Yeah, my up. home life was safe, but it wasn't like they didn't understand me. But at least it was safe. You know, I had okay. a house. I had two parents. Mm-hmm. They were there for me. There was oh, wow. nothing any crazy bad shit that really happened. Mm-hmm. But there was just a lot of like untalked about things. It would have been nice being able to talk to people about life and stuff. So there was a lot of bullshit that we didn't really talk about. So it was, I didn't feel like I was understood, but at least I was protected. And so somewhat understood. So when you come from that, you feel that you can go out into the world. So that's what I did. And I never needed to build a family. I mean, you built a family. I don't know why your reasons, but one of the reasons no, like, based, based psychologically of that, because you had, yeah, you yeah. had, you didn't have a safe upbringing. I had a longing for it. Yes, yes, exactly. So I needed so, to create it. You did not have no, a I longing. Didn't, no, I had no longing. So I'm like, I'm going to go and attack the world. Yeah. And then I was like, I don't want to have a, 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 I never even want to have a girlfriend, let alone a wife. So like, it took me a while to like, start having a girlfriend and I, and I had a few of those and then like, and then I thought, well, like, well, I don't want to have a kid. It's like I'm too doing my own thing, right? And then I thought, like, well, if you have a kid, then maybe you have like a baby mama. And I was like, well, do I even want to do that? That's not fair to the right. kid. And I'm like, right. I'm still. So then I was like, and it's only in my late, late, late forties. Now I'm fifty that I realize if I do it, you have to do the whole thing. You have to have the wonderful wife. And then you have to have to have have a wonderful child with it. And you have to keep that unit together. You can have no infidelity. You can have no outside. I wouldn't even say that you should really, you know, maybe watch little porn, but I'm over that. You know what I mean? I've, I've, I've very, I've been very fortunate. I I would probably, I'm compelled to have kids. Um, I think I'm, I'm just nervous about the timing of, of how much I would have to dedicate my life to it because you should dedicate your life to your children. Yeah. Your children should be raised as these wonderful things. You, can't, you don't think you can have both. You can be a creative artist and, and do that. You can. I, I don't find, know. I find my kids to be inspiring. Pa, 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 pa. Also to also to drive me because I have people I'm responsible for. It drives me to go yes. create and create and create and make some money. In the creative arts, I'm, it drives me. I'm half and half. Like, like the first thing is, is I gotta like get, uh, you know, I have to let go kind of my old feelings of what life was as a mm. solo act. You know what I'm saying? And I think, I mean, is there a point where you're just tired of it though? Yeah, you, you definitely, especially during COVID. No, definitely, dude. COVID, definitely. No, COVID, single guy, right? I mean, yeah, that's, that's, that had to be rough. It's well, it's just you want intimacy and yes, you. But it's also there's a lot has happened in my life, and I, you're right. It's it, and it's the great 
uh, what's the word? When you look at everything, I think it's kind of, I call it the great introspection mm -hmm. of what COVID has done. So yeah. these are very well placed questions that I'm thinking about. And I think they have to, they're, they are falling into place naturally. So I think it will happen. I, there's another comedian. I'm not gonna mention his name and he's a sweet guy and he just had a child and he's older than me and he's, he looks, he's doing it right. He's looks like he's never been this happy. And I think that's the way to do it. And he's got a wonderful wife and I think that's the way to do it. I just was like, it takes me a while to get there because, you know, I don't know how you were, but we were just, you know, we were, it was fucking you against the world. I mean, that's how it is. You go out there, you're on the road, you're on movie sets, you're traveling to fucking different countries. It's game on. Yeah, and I happen to know, you know, the kids of comedians. Mm -hmm. The comedians that you and I used to idolize. Mm -hmm. And that's not an easy life. I'm sure it's not. a child of a comedian. I'm sure it's Especially not. Especially when that comic is really dedicated to that. Yeah. To, to the craft and to and maybe, maybe working it, this out and yeah. everything else. I guess when you have like Seinfeld money, you can work out anything you want. You but it's not just money, bro. My, money doesn't make you happy, right? But it you but it does drive me to make the money. This is interesting. Now we're switching it. Now the Laughter Hills guys is worried about money. I'm not <laughs> worried. I mean, you should be comfortable, but you want to be. Well, yes, but you. I'm not talking about big money. But I'm saying when you're comfortable with your financial situation, you're not worried about taking the gig in Bakersfield for $3,000 and trying to get the people in the seats. That's the other thing. you got to pay to get people into the seats and social media and all that kind of stuff. That's not, all, that was a simple example. All I was saying was is the gigs that are local that you could make very good money at if you wanted to. But that's all. I'm sorry if I offended you. You did not your, offend me, With Jamie. your price. I had a blast today. With I, your price. They're giving us the time. Who's giving us the time? You, you didn't see... Remember that show, The Adams Family? The yeah. Movie? Oh, The Hand? The thing. <laughs> he just poked his hand. Look, see, there's the hand. He came in and said, that we're, we're overtime. I actually thought this to myself. We should have done... Maybe we'll divide this in two episodes. You should. We'll have to edit a little bit. <laughs> You with the editing. Got to edit a little bit. Do you bit. edit your podcast? Of course, dude. You do? Of I've course. never edited once. You should. We got to talk about it. <laughs> you should. You want to cultivate your image. <laughs> this, I don't want to end like this. Yeah, it just ended on something nice. A Philadelphia accent? Yeah, I guess. <laughs> you know what? My favorite Philadelphia accent is the Mummers, the Mummers commercial. Remember when we were growing up? Mm -hmm. It was for the record. They go, call now for this limited time only. A two-record set. This year, the Fur Coast String Band. Nobody even knows what a mummer is. I would think your audience does. Do you ever? No. I had a conversation literally like last week. No one knew what a mummer was. They had to look it up. Wow. They're, oh, it's Jamie. Trust me. The whole country does not know what a mummer is. The entire country, no one knows. No, but the Philly Gordon, people do. Gordon, poke your head in here. Philly Look your people head here do. for a second. Now, Gordon's our producer. Do you know what a mummer is? Say it out loud. An actor? No. Say, <laughs> an actor. A mummer is a, a parade. Mummer's parade. It's a bunch of dudes. They, they wear these big plumes, and they go down the Broad Street. It's like they, the Kiwanis Club or every, something. Every single New Year's, and they, they, they have um, banjos and xylophones. Yeah. used to go to the mummer's All parade. All the time. Get wasted. Oh. Those golden slippers, oh, those golden slippers, the same song every year. Yeah. You do the mummer strut, the mummer strut. So, see, he didn't know what it was either. But anyway, Jamie, in Philly, they know. Jamie Kennedy, Thank uh, you for where can we find you? Jamie Kennedy, Jamie Kennedy on Twitter, the Jamie Kennedy on Instagram, Jamie Kennedy on Facebook. You know, go to my YouTube page of Jamie you, Kennedy. You're so famous, you got to have your own addresses. You don't have your own? No, I had to do the Love Master. I have to explain that to everybody. I couldn't get Craig Shoemaker. Some scientist has it. Wow. Yeah, bro. Yeah, I've been trying to get it back, and I can't get my own name back. Wow. I finally got official Craig Shoemaker on, on Instagram. By the way, speaking of that, please follow me. Please follow Enlightened Up Podcast, and rate, rate us. Give us a good rating. Pass the word around, all that kind of stuff. You can get us where all podcasts are located, including YouTube, where they're going to edit half of it. Anyway, yes. Jamie Kennedy, thanks for being here. Thank you for having me, And we'll see bro. you all next time. Remember, folks, uh, enlighten the fuck up, all right? Wow, that's a good set. <laughs> <laughs>